Good afternoon and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. First, want to get caught up with my American viewers and just to let you know that there's been a lot of talk about my move to the UK and to Europe in general and what this is going to mean to the future of my channel. So I want to be completely clear and upfront about all of this. The content on my channel is not going to substantially change. I definitely recognize that the most important thing happening in spaceflight right now are happening in the United States. The U.S. and SpaceX, ULA, everybody represents the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of what's happening in spaceflight today. So these sorts of stories that you've been accustomed to seeing on my channel, this sort of content is not going to change at all. I can cover it from Europe, as I say, in the same way that one of my colleagues, a guy that I really like, whose content I really enjoy, Marcus House, he can cover these sorts of things from all the way down under in Tasmania, even further away than Australia. If he can do it, I certainly can. What is going to change is these interviews that I conduct with European space flight companies, with European space related organizations, they're not going to be online anymore. These things will be face to face. I'll be touring more facilities in Europe. And when launches begin to happen out of places like Saxevoort, I'm not going to be covering it on a remote camera, I'll be covering it in person. And I'll be one of the very few journalists in general, not just YouTubers, but journalists covering this kind of content. So some unique stuff coming to you. And for my viewers who have been supporting my move to Europe, um, especially financially, thank you so much. I am nearly at 40% of my short-term goal. That is to say enough to pay for first month's rent and deposit on a uh, flat that I'm trying to get reserved in Milton Keynes. Thank you so much for all of that. And if you'd like to support it further, well, the link is in the description. Okay, let's move on to SpaceX and their first ever space station project. Now, to be 100% clear, SpaceX is not the primary company behind this space station. Rather, it's a company called Vast. As Elon Musk pointed out a number of times in the past, Starship and SpaceX in general is not set up to provide bases or orbiting space stations, anything like that. They are, first and foremost, a transportation company. So it comes as little surprise to me that it is another company that's actually going to be built building the modules for this space station. And what has caught everybody by surprise is the incredible timetable that this company intends to work on. And I think that they're for real, unlike a lot of other companies who have promised space stations in the very near future. I think this company has the capability, it has the funding, it has the know-how. That being the case, though, what are they going to be putting up and how are they going to put it up by 2025? Well, they have huge ambitions, massive ambitions for the long term, but they also have very, very feasible vision for the short term. That is to say, the first module of their first space station will de be deployed not by Starship, but by a Falcon 9. Now, all of that having been said, I also have a little bit of skepticism about their overall business platform. I've always been a little concerned about any company that is basing their space station plans on the idea of creating artificial gravity for almost all of the habitable space. Now, why would I have a problem with that? Why is artificial gravity in orbit an issue? Well, you're going to find out in just a moment. 
So why am I taking this company so seriously? Well, let's have a look at what SpaceX has to say about them on their website in a press release that was put out yesterday. Quote, Vast announced today that SpaceX will launch what is expected to be the world's first commercial space station known as Vast Haven 1, quickly followed by two human space flight missions to said space station, scheduled to launch on a Falcon 9 rocket to low Earth orbit, no earlier than August of 2025, Haven 1 will be a fully functional independent space station and eventually be connected as a module to a larger vast space station currently in development. Dragon and its four-person crew will dock with Haven 1 for up to 30 days while orbiting Earth. The Vast 1 crew selection process is underway, and the crew will be announced at a future date. Vast's long-term goal is to develop a 100-meter-long, multi-module spinning artificial gravity space station launched by SpaceX's Starship Transportation System. In support of this, Vast will explore conducting the world's first spinning artificial gravity experiment, on a commercial space station with Haven 1. Sounds like SpaceX is taking these guys very, very seriously, but as you can see, this space station is extremely small, extremely conservative to start off with. It seems to me that Vast is just trying to get the distinction of having the first commercial space station ever by putting something very simple and straightforward in orbit, a very basic module supported by solar power that can dock directly with SpaceX Dragon. Now this is a huge shot across the bow in the commercial space station industry because there were already a number of companies that appeared to be NASA's anointed companies for providing a replacement to the International Space Station. This included Northrop Grumman, NanoRax, and of course Blue Origin and Sierra Space and the Orbital Reef Space Station. But here's the thing, Orbital Reef requires much more ambitious engineering and also untried and unproven technology, especially the inflatable modules from Sierra Space. Even though I feel that Sierra Space's inflatable modules are the future of building very large and resilient habitats in orbit, until the technology is completely proven, they're not going to be deploying anything like this in orbit. And thus far, it does not appear that Vast has any plans of using inflatable modules. Instead, it would appear that Vast is going to be making use of the same types of modules and life support that we've been using on the ISS for a considerable amount of time, and their roadmap includes increasingly larger sized modules as they become more and more capable. You start off with the Haven 1 as a keystone for a larger space station that will be comprised of multiple Starship class modules. As the name suggests, this 7 meter diameter module is designed to be used inside Starship's fairing exclusively. I don't even think New Glenn could handle this, assuming that they even wanted to use New Glenn. This appears to be an exclusive partnership between Vast and SpaceX. And once they have proven the capabilities of this module, they're going to create what's called a spinning stick station, 100 meters in length, comprised of seven Starship modules. Now, as the name suggests, the spinning stick will create artificial gravity by means of centrifugal force, or should I say centrifugal? No, I think I'll say centrifugal. Anyway, it will create a simulated gravity approximating asteroid level gravity and then lunar gravity followed by Martian gravity and then finally a full 1G and that will presumably exist in the outermost modules. The further out you go, the more centrifugal force you generate and the more artificial gravity you can generate. Now the reason I have a problem with artificial gravity space stations is it defeats the purpose of going to space 
place in the first place. So many important industries that can only exist in space only exist because of microgravity. It is for this reason that Orbital Reef was designed without any artificial gravity because you cannot conduct important things like 3D printing of biological products such as 3D printed organs. That can't be done in any environment except for microgravity. 3D printing new types of metallic alloys. That has to be done in microgravity. Aside from getting rid of the dangers and pitfalls of microgravity and what it does to the human body, there isn't a whole lot of other advantages to generating artificial gravity except to simulate the long-term effects of lunar and Martian gravity on the human body, which is extremely important, but it seems to be kind of a narrow application. It would appear that these kinds of space stations, rotating artificial gravity space stations, are only suitable for residential types of complexes, where people who work in space are going to be able to live in the long run. And it is for this reason that I've been somewhat critical of companies like Orbital Assembly who are planning to build these massive rotating space stations. And by the way, the Voyager station that they have in mind is to be built in sun-synchronous orbit where there will be few other space stations for them to service. The whole idea of building a massive space station like this that really can only be used for habitation and possibly hotels doesn't seem to be the best business business model. But guess what? Vast already has that in mind. In conjunction with their spinning stick station, they intend to operate an ever-growing number of co-orbital free-flying ancillary zero-gravity modules. Pristine zero-gravity being available in the ancillary modules for large-scale manufacturing, research, and tourism while maintaining rapid access to the gravitational assets of the spinning station. This is a hell of a plan. I think this is the perfect way to build a long-term community in space, taking advantage of all of the manufacturing and scientific benefits that exist in microgravity while also making artificial gravity available to the residents and workers in space so they don't suffer as much from the impact of microgravity and all of the bone loss, muscle degradation, etc. that one experiences after spending lots of time in orbit. This is a very, very good plan. A plan that has realistic short-term objectives, in other words, the Haven 1, with massive, ambitious, long-term ambitions, such as the proliferated station fleet, the massive rotating stations that we've been accustomed to seeing in works of science fiction in the past. This is the final stage of vast plan, something that they don't intend to get going until the 2040s, and they will build this station up bit by bit, gathering valuable experience, investors, and customers every step of the way. And this starts even before they complete their first space station module. Recently, Vast acquired a company called Launcher, whose business was not to build a space station module, but rather a satellite tug designed to carry CubeSats for the most part, but satellites up to 400 kilograms in mass to different orbits usually higher orbits. So in other words, if your satellite is on a rideshare mission with SpaceX but needed to go to a different orbit than that Falcon 9 was headed to, this tug was designed to take your payload to a different orbit. Unfortunately, this tug was tested at the beginning of this year and it failed. Now I'm not sure if that failure led to some sort of financial crisis at launcher, but regardless, Vast acquired them almost immediately there after. And once they did that, they decided to go ahead and pick up this tug and use it as a stepping stone to Haven 1. How so? Well, they're going to use this tug to train, design, produce, integrate, launch, and operate in space to develop and test in orbit safety-critical human-rated space station avionics hardware and software, which will evolve from Orbiter to Haven 1, and also to 
develop systems and expertise for in-space maneuvers and approaches which are critical to space station assembly and resupply, and finally, to test Haven 1 subsystems in orbit, including life support, avionics, software, communication, materials, and sensors. So this will be the first stage in VAST's overall plan of deploying a space station module by 2025 and a whole lot more modules in the years to come. So are there any drawbacks to this plan? Well, possibly, because thus far this station is almost exclusively being funded by this man, Jed McCaleb. He's not a very well-known person, but he's worth over two and a half billion dollars. He's a software developer who is one of the creators of a supposedly infamous Mount Gox Bitcoin exchange. I honestly don't know what that is. And also a founder of the crypto protocol Ripple. Also don't know what that is, but regardless, this man is almost exclusively responsible for funding this mission thus far, whereas Sierra Space, Blue Origin, all of the people who are working on the NASA-approved space stations for the ISS, well, they have received billions of dollars in funding, both from the government and from private sources. This is something where VAST may have to play some catch-up, although, in my opinion, given the fact that VAST has obviously been able to convince SpaceX that this is a worthwhile endeavor, otherwise they certainly wouldn't be advertising it on their website, and given just how solid of a plan this is, starting off small with very viable, very doable objectives, working up to amazingly ambitious objectives in the future, well, I have some very good feelings about this company and their long-term objectives. I think that they are worthy as adversaries for Orbital Reef, Sierra Space, and Blue Origin. Game on! Smash that like, hit that subscribe, also please hit those notification bells so you'll continue to receive my content as I release it, not when YouTube wants you to see it, and also if you'd like to continue supporting my move to Europe, the links are in the description, and as always, stay angry about space!